Hello, I'm Jonathan Itzan. Today we are going to talk about neoclassical political economy, or economics as most people know it. Neoclassical political economy is the dominant ideology. It's the way in which most people understand the capitalist world we live in. But as we shall see, the underpinnings of neoclassical political economy are problematic, to put it politely. In many cases, they are simply dead wrong. So those who follow neoclassical political economy are skating on thin ice. Let's begin by examining some of the hallmarks of the neoclassical model. First, the economy is assumed to exist as a self-regulating closed system. What that means is that, is that the economy operates based on its own inner laws, quite independently of what happens elsewhere in, in society, such as in politics or in culture. That doesn't mean that there is no interaction between these aspects of society and the economy. It only means that the interaction takes the form of external shocks that rattle the economy and distort it from the outside. The economy is assumed to be populated by numerous rational agents, and because these agents are assumed to be numerous and small, none of them can individually affect the overall market outcome. These agents are all motivated by the desire to maximize their hedonic pleasure, or utility as the neoclassicists call it. Each agent comes to the market with his or her initial endowments. For example, some will come with their labor, others will come with their raw material, and still others will come with their capital. Neoclassical political economy is rather ahistorical when it comes to these initial endowments. It tells us nothing about where these endowments come from and why is it that some agents have plenty of them while others have very little. These initial endowments then enter into a production function. A production function is a technical blueprint that tells us how the initial endowments acting as inputs together produce the final output of the economy. The economic agents interact with each other by exchanging their goods and services or commodities on the market. And these market interactions lead to equilibrium. Equilibrium tells us two things. It tells us how much is being produced and consumed and at what price and how the output or the income generated gets distributed between the various agents. The net result is a highly elegant model that rules the world, but as we shall see, every step of the way is besieged by logical difficulties and ontological problems. When we put these problems together, we end up with a result that resembles religion more than a science. Let's begin with utility maximization. According to the neoclassicists, this is the inner calling of all economic agents. It is the thing they all live and die for. Now, the mere idea that human beings try to better their lot is hardly new, of course. What is new, though, is the notion that this is what drives and organizes society. The idea of utility maximization emerged together with the transition from feudalism to capitalism. In feudalism, classes are bound together through religious obligations of fealty and serfdom. But as the feudal serfs were kicked off the land and started moving to the growing capitalist towns and cities, there was a need for a new ideology to organize them. And this new ideology was standalone individualism. The notion that people were driven by utility was articulated by the so-called philosophical radicals. According to Jeremy Bentham, nature has placed mankind under the governance of two sovereign masters, pain and pleasure. They govern us in all we do, in all we say, in all we think. Moreover, according to Bentham, pleasure is quantifiable and can be counted in universal units. He says, prejudice apart, the game of pushpin is of equal value with the arts and sciences of music and poetry.
For example, you can say that lying in bed yields 20 units of pleasure and that having a nice meal gives you 5, but then having to work for a day in the factory subtracts 50. These, of course, are qualitatively different activities, but quantitatively, in terms of the pleasure they generate, they are universal, they can be compared and aggregated. Finally, and perhaps most importantly, according to Bentham, this pleasure can be compared and aggregated across individuals, which means that we can use it as a basis for organizing liberal society as a whole. The greatest happiness of the greatest number, he says, is the foundation of morals and legislation. Now, this philosophy was useful in relieving the masses from the feudal obligations, but it was also dangerous for its radical suggestion that the utilities of the masses and of their rulers were equally important. So, from Bentham onward, the radical element of utilitarianism was gradually diluted. The early neoclassicists didn't think we can measure utility. According to Stanley Jevons, for example, a unit of pleasure or pain is difficult even to conceive. But this observation didn't determine the least. Although he considered these units inconceivable, he went on to state that it is the amount of these feelings which is continually promoting us to buying and selling, borrowing and lending, laboring and resting, producing and consuming. And it is from the quantitative effects of the feelings that we must estimate their comparative amounts. This last bit is particularly important because it inverts the order. Recall that according to the neoclassicist, the quantity of utility is supposed to explain our actions. But here, Jevons goes in reverse. He uses our actions in order to estimate the quantity of utility. And Alfred Marshall, another important neoclassicist, is saying the exact same thing, and I quote, Utility is taken to be correlative to desire or want. It has been already argued that desires cannot be measured directly, but only indirectly, by the outward phenomena to which they give rise, and that in those cases with which economics is chiefly concerned, the measure is found in the price, which a person is willing to pay for the fulfillment or satisfaction of his desires. So again, the desires cannot be measured directly, and what we should do is go in reverse, look at actions in order to conclude about utility. The predicament here was neatly summarized by the heterodox political economist John Robinson. Utility, she says, is a metaphysical concept of impregnable circularity. Utility is the quality in commodities that makes individuals want to buy them, and the fact that individuals want to buy commodities shows that they have utility. The result of this circularity is stunning. It means that neoclassical political economy can explain everything in theory, but nothing in practice. To illustrate, let's have a look at the global oil market. In principle, utilitarian laws of supply and demand should help us predict the price of oil. But as these headlines taken from the financial press show, they never do. Take the first two headlines. If OPEC cuts output, prices should rise, and that's what the first quote says. But the second quote observes the exact opposite, namely that all prices disobeyed the laws of supply and demand, and that prices fell despite a cut in output. And this pattern repeats in all subsequent pairs. In one statement, the market obeys the neoclassical laws of supply and demand, and in the other statement, it disobeys them. So how could that be? Can you imagine, for example, a physicist stating that last year, planet Earth obeyed Newton's law of gravitation, but this year it didn't? The fact that you don't hear such statements from physicists, but you do hear them from economists, is because, unlike in the hard sciences, 
the tools of neoclassical political economy, namely supply, demand and equilibrium, are entirely imaginary. Let's examine these tools a little bit more closely. The market demand curve describes the desires of buyers to buy the commodity at alternative prices, everything else remaining the same. Similarly, the market supply curve describes the desires of sellers to sell the commodity at alternative prices, again, all else remaining the same. For example, if the price is $4.4 per unit, buyers will want to buy less than sellers will want to sell. So there is excess supply or glut, which appears in the form of rising undesired inventories. The only way to get rid of these undesired inventories is to have the price decline. And as the price declines, buyers will want to buy more, sellers will want to sell less, until these two sets of desires equilibrate at the point of equilibrium. At this point, there is no reason for further change, so equilibrium is both desirable as well as stable. The same logic operates only in reverse when the price is lower than equilibrium. For example, when the price is $1.8 per unit, buyers will want to buy more than sellers will want to sell, creating excess demand. The way to eliminate that excess demand is to have the price rise. Sellers will want to sell more as the price increases, buyers will want to buy less as the price increases until we reach equilibrium in which these desires equilibrate. And at that point, there is again no reason for change. So that point is also a point that is stable and desirable. So the lesson is simple. Markets self-equilibrate. And if we know the demand and supply curves, we can predict the resulting equilibrium quantity and price. And there is more. So far, we dealt with a given pair of curves, but the position of these curves, and therefore the equilibrium point between them can change. For example, if the income of the average consumer rises, then the demand curve is going to shift up and to the right, causing equilibrium to go up on the supply curve. Similarly, if the cost of one of the inputs, say capital, is more expensive, the supply curve will shift up and to the left, causing the equilibrium point to migrate upwards on, and to the left on the demand curve. Now, this is what the model says in theory, but how does it work in practice? Well, the answer is that it doesn't, and let me show you why. This figure shows the actual market for capital goods in the United States from 1929 to the present. On the vertical axis, each observation gives us the price of capital goods relative to the average price level in the economy. On the horizontal axis, each observation shows us the absolute quantity produced and consumed expresses an index. Now, because this historical time series slopes downwards, a non-economist might think it represents the demand curve, but that's not what an economist is likely to say. Instead, an economist would argue that each observation shows an equilibrium point of a given set of supply and demand curves, like that. And as these curves shift, the equilibrium point changes and we get the progression of the time series, like that. But is this really true? Perhaps it is, if the market indeed jumps from one equilibrium to the next. But what if the market is in disequilibrium? For example, we can have a situation of excess supply, like this one. Or we can have a situation of excess demand, like this one. We can also have an in-between situation like this one, or we can have a situation in which the market outcome has nothing to do with supply and demand like this one. And so we have a problem. To say something meaningful about the world, neoclassicists must know where the demand and supply curves are exactly 
and that they are indeed equilibrated. Unfortunately, they know neither. To reiterate, demand and supply reflect utility and desires, which neoclassicists admit cannot be conceived, let alone measured. So that's a bad start already. But even if economists knew supply and demand, there is nothing in their theory to ascertain that the two are indeed equilibrated. So as it stands, neoclassical theory is entirely non-operational. Now, for argument's sake, let's assume that we do know supply and demand and that the market is always in equilibrium. Unfortunately, though, even that is not enough. Equilibrium has two variables, price and quantity, which neoclassicists find by solving a system of two independent equations, supply and demand. But if supply and demand are not independent of each other, a movement along one curve will cause the other to change. So we end up not with one equilibrium, but possibly with many. So are demand and supply independent of each other? Neoclassicists claim they are. In a perfectly competitive market, they argue, individual buyers cannot affect the market supply curve, while individual sellers cannot affect the market demand curve. These curves are beyond their control. But what if we are not in a perfectly competitive market? Can we still argue that demand and supply are indeed independent of each other? The answer is no, for three different reasons. First, capitalists shape consumer wants. Second, there is oligopoly. And third, there is Piero Sraffa. Let's begin with the first point, the idea that capitalists shape consumer wants. For neoclassicists, this idea is pure nonsense. According to Paul Samuelson, capitalists can try to influence consumers until they are blue in the face. It won't help them. In the final analysis, he says, the consumer is sovereign. Now, it's interesting that the theory of perfect competition between powerless agents, particularly between powerless sellers and powerless buyers, emerged when it was becoming irrelevant. By the end of the 19th century, we see the rise of bigness, big business, large governments, and growing labor unions. This transformation was very important, and if we fast forward to the present, we can easily see why. The cost of constructing new productive capacity can be staggering. A nuclear reactor, for example, can cost up to $25 billion. A semiconductor plant can cost up to $10 billion. And designing a new car or developing a new drug, up to $3 billion, and so on. These facilities are all built to yield profit for many years to come, so they depend on predictable demand and predictability doesn't sit well with consumer sovereignty. Henry Ford, who invented the assembly line of mass production, didn't have much patience for consumer sovereignty. If I had asked people what they wanted, he said, they would have said faster horses. In his opinion, consumers didn't really know what they wanted. They had to be told. Their wants had to be created, imposed, and regulated by capitalists like himself. One way of imposing such wants is advertisement, which sucks in more than half a trillion dollars worldwide every year. But this is just the tip of the iceberg. Most spending on persuasion is built right into the commodities themselves. For example, when you buy a new car, up to one quarter of the price you pay for it is simply to cover the cost of annual model changes. These changes usually affect the appearance of the car, not its underlying technology. The main purpose of it is simply to persuade you to let go of your existing car for something new. And to the extent that this persuasion works, and it certainly does work to some extent, then demand definitely depends on supply.
The second reason why demand and supply are interdependent is oligopoly. Introductory neoclassical textbooks speak about four market structures, perfect competition, monopolistic competition, oligopoly, and monopoly. The most important of these, they argue, is perfect competition. This is the ideal structure, and introductory courses spent most of the time unraveling its intricacies. The other important structure, they say, is monopoly. This is the evil antithesis of perfect competition, the enemy that students should learn to hate. Now, in between these two ideal types, we find a broad range with monopolistic competition, where small firms compete on differentiated products, and oligopoly, where the market is dominated by a handful of giants. Most instructors devote very little time, and often no time at all, to these in-between structures, and they particularly love to neglect oligopoly. And that's noteworthy, because in modern-day capitalism, oligopoly is not the exception, it's the rule. The market for consumer goods, for example, has numerous brands, but most of these brands are owned by a few giants, in this case by Kraft, Mondelez, Nestle, Procter & Gamble, Johnson & Johnson, Unilever, Mars, Kellogg's, General Mills, PepsiCo, and Coca-Cola. In other words, it's an oligopoly. And this structure is prevalent in most markets you can think of. So why is oligopoly a problem for neoclassical theory in general and for the independence of demand and supply in particular? Well, one reason is that oligopolistic firms are mutually interdependent and their interdependency causes demand to change with supply. To start with, oligopolistic firms cooperate, and cooperation tends to kill the neoclassical model pretty much immediately. But even if they do not cooperate and instead compete, their interaction still is very problematic. Let's take an example from the breakfast cereal market. Think about Kellogg's. And let's assume that when Kellogg's changes the price, the other oligopolistic competitors do exactly the same. If it raises the price by 5%, they raise it by 5% as well. If it lowers it by 5%, they do the same. Under this type of interaction, there will be specific demand curves for each of the competitors. But what if the reactions of the competitors to Kellogg's actions is different? For example, if Kellogg's lower the price, then they will do the same. They lower the price by the same percentage. But if Kellogg's raises the price, they do nothing. They keep their prices the same. Under this second scenario, the demand curves emerging from the interaction will be very different than in the first scenario. Conclusion, the specific interactions among sellers on the supply side determines the shape of the demand on the demand side. And this perhaps is why Paul Sweezy in the 1930s in his paper on the kinked demand curve said that it becomes very doubtful whether the traditional search for the equilibrium solution to a problem in oligopoly has very much meaning. And since oligopolies rule capitalism, it means that demand tends to depend on supply even if we ignore the brainwashing of consumers by firms. And then there is Piero Sraffa. Sraffa loved to tackle the neoclassicists on their own terms. In an article he wrote in 1926, he said, let's take a big industry and consider what happens when producers increase their output and therefore go up on their short-run supply curve. To do so, they will need to buy more variable inputs, such as labor and raw materials. And because the industry is assumed to be large, the increased demand for those inputs will cause their prices to increase. This increase will redistribute income in favor of the owners of those inputs. And as income gets redistributed, the demand curve will shift as suppliers move on the supply curve. 
So we have one supply curve and movement on the supply curve shift the demand curve. So in the case of a large industry, demand depends on supply and there is no unique equilibrium. By contrast, if the industry is, is small, he said, there are no longer fixed factors of production and the supply curve is flat. But that's a problem because if the supply curve is flat, there is no limit on the size of firms. And as firms grow in size, perfect competition gives rise to oligopoly and eventually to monopoly. And the neoclassical model then breaks down. So to recap, demand depends on supply for three different reasons. One, because capitalists shape consumer wants. Two, because oligopolies are interdependent. And three, because of Piero Sraffa. And since demand depends on supply, the neoclassical model generates many points of equilibrium and therefore no clear theoretical outcome. But that is not the end of it. The neoclassical model tells us that market demand slopes downward and market supply slopes upward. But do they? Start from the market demand curve. Economic textbooks derive the market demand curve through the horizontal summation of individual demand curves. In this example, we have a market with three individuals and we try to derive the market demand curve based on their individual demand curves. Let's say that the price is $15. At this price, the quantity demanded by every individual consumer in the market is zero. So the quantity demanded in the overall market is also zero. If the price is $12, the first two individuals will demand zero and the third individual will demand one. So the market total will be one. And if the price goes down to $9, the first individual will demand zero, the second will demand one, and the third will demand two. So the market total will be three and so on. According to this logic, if individual demand curves slope downward, the overall market demand curve will also slope downward. Or will it? The problem is that horizontal summation assumes that when we change the price along the demand curve, all other things remain equal. But this assumption is false. One of those other things that are supposed to remain fixed is the income of agents. But income depends on prices. So when we change prices, we also change the incomes of agents. And when the incomes of agents change, the individual demand curves shift. This link between prices and incomes means that unless all agents have the exact same preferences, and unless their preferences do not change with the income. The redistribution of income between agents created by changing prices will constantly shift the individual demand curves. And these constant shifts mean that the market demand curve need not slope downward even if all the underlying individual demand curves do. This conclusion, known as the sonnenschein mantel de Bru theorem, or SMD for short, states that market demand curves can have almost any shape and that this anything goes shape means that we can have many points of intersection between the demand curve and the supply curve and therefore many points of equilibrium. So again, the neoclassical theory breaks down before we even started. And what about the supply curve? Does it slope upward? As we shall see, the answer is that nobody knows, or more accurately, that nobody can know. We already noted that neoclassicists insist that the consumer is sovereign. And this love for royalty is extended also to the supply side. In their introductory text, Paul Samuelson and his collaborators argue that the economy is ruled by two monarchs consumers and technology. And why is technology so important? Because technology is supposed to generate the supply curve. 
The textbook derivation is pretty straightforward and can be summarized by several simple charts. You start from the top left, from the production function. The production function generates the cost curve, which you can see on the top right, and from there you can generate the short run supply curve in the bottom right. Unlike the subjective demand side, the supply side appears objective, quantitative, and scientific, except it isn't. To put things in context, we need to go back a bit to the late 19th century. John D. Rockefeller, who founded the Standard Oil of New Jersey and was considered the world's richest capitalist, donated 45 millions to the University of Chicago. Towards the end of his life, he said it was the best investment he had ever made. And why? Because the University of Chicago went on to become the leading bastion of neoclassical economics. And neoclassical economics helped legitimize Rockefeller and his kind. And why was it necessary to legitimize capitalists? Well, primarily because of growing inequality. According to this chart, Wealth inequality rose dramatically in the latter half of the 19th century. By 1910, the top 10% of the population owned 80% of the wealth in the US and 90% in Europe. And surprising as it may sound, during the late 19th century, there was no satisfactory theory to justify this disparity. Some writers, such as Nassau Sr., explain the income of capitalists as a return for their abstinence. Because they are so rich, he said, they can consume a lot. But they abstain from consumption in order to invest, and since their abstinence is so great, they deserve an equally great return. Other writers, such as Alfred Marshall, try to refine this justification by replacing abstinence with waiting. Capitalists to invest have to wait before getting back what they invested. And this waiting, he said, deserved a proportionate return. But these justifications sounded hopelessly unscientific, not to say apologetic and self-serving. And it was only with John Bates Clark that the neoclassicists were finally offered a seemingly scientific theory of distribution. In contrast to his apologetic predecessors, Clark argued that income in general, and capitalist income in particular, were based on productivity. In his book on the distribution of wealth, Clark claims that natural law dictates that under conditions of perfect competition, or in his words, without friction, every agent receives in wealth exactly what he or she produces. Or, in simple words, that if Rockefeller earns a million times more than his average worker, it is because Rockefeller is a million times more productive. This theory of distribution by productivity dominates economics till this very day, so it's worth looking into it a bit further. The basic tool of this theory is the so-called production function, where output Q is a mathematical function of the various inputs, namely labor, land, and capital. The theory is based on several assumptions. First, the factors of production are distinct, observable, and most importantly, measurable. Second, the production function gives us a clear mathematical blueprint. If you know the quantities of the inputs, you know the quantity of the output. Third, each factor has its own intrinsic productivity. And fourth and finally, under conditions of perfect competition, the income of each factor is equal to the factor's marginal productivity. This theory was a major achievement. It proved that the capitalist system, no matter how unequal, was not only efficient, but also just. Moreover, both efficiency and justice were automatic, so there was no need for any outside intervention 
in the operation of Rockefeller and his fellow capitalists. In this sense, the return on Rockefeller's investment in the University of Chicago was indeed enormous. However, despite its success, Clark's theory of distribution by productivity was deeply problematic for two basic reasons. First, the theory worked only in perfect competition, but we don't live in perfect competition. And outside this fairy tale world, in other words, in the actual world that Rockefeller and other capitalists had fortified, income is determined not by productivity, but by power. So the theory has no traction whatsoever. And it gets even worse. It turns out that even in perfect competition, the theory falls flat on its face. Recall that the theory depends on the existence of a production function. But does this production function exist? On the face of it, this might seem like an odd question to ask, but it isn't. Let's look again at this function. To know the output Q, we need to know the quantities of labor, land, and capital. Now, labor and land are relatively easy to count, but capital isn't. Unlike labor and land, capital is made of many different things. Computers, ships, tractors, trucks, machine tools, factories, and so on and on. These are all qualitatively different entities. So how do we aggregate them into a single quantity? Capitalists have a simple answer. They simply add the capitalized value of these items. To understand capitalization, we can start with the rate of return. The rate of return is simply the ratio of the profit to be earned relative to the value of the invested capital. For example, if a capitalist invests a million dollars worth of capital and earns $100,000 in profit, the rate of return is 10%, or 0.1 in decimals. Now, if we rearrange this expression, it follows that the capitalized value of the profit is given by dividing the profit by the rate of return. This is the gist of capitalization, and we can illustrate it with a few examples. For instance, if the asset is expected to generate an annual profit of $1 billion, and if the capitalist wants this profit to represent 10% or 0.1 in decimal, the capitalist would be willing to pay or demand to receive $10 billion for it. Similarly, if the expected profit is twice as large at $2 billion, the capitalization would be $20 billion. And if the profit is still $1 billion, but the rate of return is only 5%, then capitalization will double to 20 billion. So in practice, capital is routinely quantified and aggregated by capitalization. But then this capitalized quantification, and here is the key point, is entirely useless for the production function. Remember that the purpose of the production function is to explain how the quantities of the inputs operate to produce the output and generate income, and specifically to explain how the productivity of capital justifies the profits of the capitalist. But if we use capitalization to measure capital, we move in a circle. The quantity of capital determines its productivity, and the productivity of capital determines its profit. But and this is a very important but, in order to measure the quantity of capital, we must first know the profit, but then the profit is what the theory is supposed to explain. This circularity was examined in the Cambridge controversies in the theory of capital. These controversies raged in the 1950s and 60s between neoclassicists in Cambridge, Massachusetts and the critics in Cambridge, England. This was one of the most important debates in economics, but then many economists don't even know about it. 
and you'll quickly see why. The most important contribution to this debate was made in a 99-page book written by Pieros Rafa. The book, which took almost 40 years to complete, showed a built-in inconsistency in the way neoclassicists measure capital. Because capital goods are heterogeneous and cannot be added in their own natural units, neoclassicists take a detour. They measure capital intensity by the rate of interest. And why is that? Because the cost of capital rises with the rate of interest. And so capitalists are likely to use less of it when the rate of interest is high and more of it when the rate of interest is low. In other words, the capital intensity of production is inversely related to the rate of interest. The higher the rate of interest, the smaller the amount of capital and vice versa. Now, to be meaningful, this must be a one-to-one -one relationship. Every quantity of capital must be associated with one and only one rate of interest. If this requirement does not hold, we end up with the same capital stock having more than one quantity, which of course is a contradiction. And yet, that is exactly what Srafa found. This hypothetical chart, taken from Srafa's book, illustrates what came to be known as re-switching. Let's assume that capitalists have two methods of production. Method one, which is less capital intensive, and method two, which is more capital intensive. In this hypothetical example, Srafa shows that as long as the rate of profit, which he uses interchangeably with the rate of interest, is less than 4%, capitalists will adopt method two, which is more capital intensive, because the low rate of profit makes it cheaper. But if the rate of profit rises and eventually surpasses 4%, method one, which is less capital intensive, becomes cheaper and capitalists will switch to it. However, if the rate of profit continues to increase and rises above 12%, method two will again become cheaper, so capitalists will re-switch to it. And this re-switching is a problem. Recall that neoclassicists assume that there is a one-to-one -one mapping between the rate of profit and the intensity of capital. But re-switching means that the given method of production can have more than one capital intensity. For instance, in this particular case, as long as the rate of profit is less than 12%, method two is more capital intensive than method one. But when the rate of profit rises above 12%, method two suddenly becomes less capital intensive. And that of course is impossible since methods of production can have only one intensity of capital by definition. Srafa's reswitching was a bombshell. According to Srafa, reswitching was not an exception. It was the rule, and that rule was devastating. It meant that in general, neoclassicists don't have a unique quantity of capital to put into their production function, and therefore that the production function as a whole was defunct. And that was just for starters, because without the production function, there is no supply curve. And without the supply curve, the entire neoclassical model collapses. These claims created a heated debate. But in the end, the neoclassical luminaries had to admit that the model was problematic, to put it politely. Paul Samuelson, perhaps the most important neoclassical economist at the time, wrote that if all this causes headaches for those nostalgic for the old time parables of neoclassical writings, we must remind ourselves that scholars are not born to live an easy existence. We must respect and appraise the facts of life. Charles Ferguson, another neoclassical luminary wrote that in the last analysis, neoclassical theory depends upon the basic nature of the thing called capital. Placing reliance upon neoclassical economic theory is a matter of faith. I personally have the faith, he wrote, but at present the best I can do to convince others is to invoke the weight of Samuelson's authority.
In a more philosophical mode, John Robinson, the critic, observed that no doubt Professor Ferguson's restatement of capital theory will be used to train new generations of students to erect elegant seeming arguments in terms which they cannot define and will confirm econometricians in the search for answers to unaskable questions. Criticism, she predicted, can have no effect. As he himself says, it is a matter of faith. And Robinson's prediction was spot on. Criticism can have no effect. This chart is taken from the 19th edition of Samuelson's Eternal Textbook. The book doesn't mention the Cambridge controversies even once. And as you can see, the quantity of capital K, the same quantity that Samuelson himself admitted was unquantifiable, appears right there on the horizontal axis. As it turns out, Samuelson and his numerous neoclassical followers show no respect to the facts of life. So it is time to summarize. In this presentation, we saw that neoclassical theory hinges on utility that cannot be measured. It relies on demand and supply curves that cannot be observed. It depends on equilibrium whose existence it cannot confirm. It requires but cannot show that demand and supply are mutually independent. It claims but cannot demonstrate that the market demand curve slopes downward. And it must but cannot measure capital and therefore cannot draw the supply curve, even on paper. And so, neoclassical political economy continues to skate on thin ice.